All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Right now, we're joined by four classes from across North America. Two more might be joining us soon. So I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So first, we've got Miss Ho's grade eight class in Mashpee, Massachusetts. Hi, guys. Hi, it's actually our robotics class for high school. Robotics oh, class for oh, high school. We love, we love high school robotics classes and perfect for astrophysics. Uh, we've got Miss Leaney's uh, grade four through sixes in Seaforth, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hi. We've got Mr. Wright's not camera working grade nines in Chatham, Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. And we've got the Montague Library Homeschool Group in Montague, Prince Edward Island. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Like how many of you there are. That's awesome. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live by Travis Fisher, who is an astrophysicist from the Catholic University of America, who is joining us from the Goddard Space Flight Center, one of the most iconic and storied research facilities in the world. Now, he works on supermassive black holes, which are the most powerful objects, things in the entire universe. So he's going to share a little bit more about what those are, about what his work entails, and about the future of space exploration and discovery through the James Webb Space Telescope as well. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Travis, and take it away. Hey, thanks, Jeffy. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to talk with me today. Um, so as he said, um, I'm here at Goddard Space Flight Center. This is my office that I work in every day. Um, and I do research looking at supermassive black holes. So I'll do a little bit of a screen share here. There's a classroom. So just to recap a little bit about me, uh, I'm from Wisconsin originally. So uh, I grew up a little bit outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, my mom works at Home Depot and my dad fixes cars and sells them uh, himself as a wholesale car dealer. And so I was interested in being a teacher uh, actually when I was going through high school because all of the cool people that I knew that weren't working at Home Depot or selling cars were teachers. So I tried going to uh, the University of Wisconsin Whitewater to be a teacher um, in, in the end. But uh, I found out that the classes that I were taking, uh, it was going to be a long time before I actually became a teacher. So uh, instead, I, I became um, interested in the work done with astronomy uh, because one of the faculty members there was a prominent astronomer at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So here's a picture of him. Um, his name is Bob Benjamin, and he looks at our Milky Way and tries to figure out how the spiral arms in our Milky Way. Uh, what it looks like because we it's a really tough thing to visualize when we're actually in the Milky Way And so that was really neat. Uh, I got involved with him and we got to go to Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona So that's what these little these telescopes are down in the corner And you got to go use the telescopes to go look at some galaxies ourselves and get some experience Which was really fun and so the the idea of looking out into the universe and traveling to these remote locations to get the perfect observing conditions was really interesting to me. Um, so also when you're an undergrad and if you were interested in pursuing uh, some sort of research in astronomy, uh, I did an RU program, which is a research experience for undergraduates, uh, which put me at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so that's me in the back middle, with super big uh, puffy hair. And so there's a bunch of folks, a lot of these folks have also continued on to be astronomers. Um, but this is a, that was a really great stepping stone to provide a bunch of experience and um, work with programming that you can use then to uh, propel yourself into graduate school, which really helped me, I, I think, excel in uh, graduate school. So once I graduated from college, I went down to uh, Georgia State University um, because it was the university that was furthest away from Wisconsin that accepted me. So I, I thought that that was exciting. Uh, and I got involved there with the program looking at data from the Hubble Space Telescope and also uh, another telescope down in New Mexico uh, that's uh, from Apache Point Observatory. So I did a lot of um, analysis on the work that I'm going to talk with you today about. That's how I got interested in that, because I liked galaxies. I thought they were very interesting objects versus stars. So you got to Georgia State University, and either you looked at stars or you looked at galaxies. I thought stars were kind of boring. So I aimed at more looking at galaxies, and that's why how I got to be where I am today. 
And then after I graduated from Georgia State University, I got a postdoctoral position here at Goddard Space Flight Center. So um, this is actually my second job at Goddard. My first job was a, um, a NASA postdoctoral program fellow where they um, gave me this office and let me do the research that I was doing because it pertains to future missions that NASA uh, intends to proceed with. And then uh, since I've gotten here, I have received some grant money uh, from the Space Telescope Science Institute and NASA to continue doing my research. So I'm paying myself as a postdoc now, and my official title is a research scientist through the Catholic University of America. And so that's what I'm doing now is I'm continuing to do the research uh, that I'm interested in. And so the postdoc life is a very sweet life when you're interested in doing research because you have no teaching um, obligations. Uh, you get to come talk to people uh, in classrooms whenever you want, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and so here we are today. So um, I work on supermassive black holes, but what are black holes in the first place? So let's start small and talk about how we see uh, stellar black holes. So the our sun, after it has expelled and, and gone through all of its hydrogen, is eventually going to contract down into a white dwarf. So stars that are about the mass of our sun become these little uh, embers of stars that are white dwarfs. But if you go a little bit larger, um, about four to eight times the mass of the sun, you uh, no longer create a white dwarf, but instead you create a neutron star, which has compacted down so hard that all that's left is just a bunch of neutrons that are fused together that form this fr uh, very magnetic, very dense um, remnant of the more massive star. And then when you go even larger, um, you're, when you're talking about eight times the mass of the sun, um, around 20 times the mass of the sun, now you're creating a star that when it finishes its life cycle, it uh, collapses on itself. It collapses so hard that it's able to form a black hole, which is so dense that not even light can escape. So what does that mean that uh, light can't escape from a black hole? Well, each of these objects and Earth, we all can uh, calculate what an escape velocity is. So if you're trying to launch like a rocket from Earth to go up to the space station or go to Mars and land an awesome probe on there like we ha saw yesterday with the InSight mission. Uh, you need to create something, a rocket that's gonna go fast enough that it's going to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. And so you need to calculate what its escape velocity is. So a black hole then is so dense and has such a high gravitational pull that the escape velocity to escape out of the black hole, you have to be going faster than the speed of light. And so since nothing can be faster than the speed of light, that's how nothing escapes a black hole, not even light. So a massive star creates these stellar mass black holes, but the stellar mass black holes are relatively small. Um, so if you take that black hole and say that it has uh, eight solar masses in it, uh, that has a radius of about 24 kilometers or 15 miles. Um, and so that's about the size of the state of Rhode Island in the United States. So it's, it's uh, not really big. But what I'm more interested in are the supermassive black holes that we see. And so those are much, much more uh, large than your typical star. So uh, this is a picture then, or a artist's uh, interpretation of what a supermassive black hole might look like. And so particularly, this, this is the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. We call it Sagittarius A star because it's in the Sagittarius constellation in the night sky. And so the uh, supermassive black holes are huge. They have millions to billions of solar masses uh, worth of matter inside of them and thus have a huge gigantic gravitational potential and can pull lots of stuff into them if they get close. And it's uh, really huge. It's about uh, 16 million miles wide. Um, I think that's around 20 million kilometers. Sorry, kilometer folks. Um, and then, so for comparison, then our sun is about 1 million kilometers wide or um, 0.8 million kilometers, uh, a million miles wide. So this thing is honking. And so we think that there is a supermassive black hole pretty much in the center of every galaxy that's out there. So we know that the Milky Way has one because we've been able to track stars orbiting around it. So this is uh, work done by the Keck UCLA Galactic Center Group uh, where they used infrared observations. They looked at stars um, with infrared telescopes over the course of 20 something years. And you're able to see that these stars uh, whip around some point in the very center 
of the of the the galaxy. And so the only way that we can explain this uh, is if there is a very compact, very highly uh, ma very massive object in the center that's able to whip these stars around as fast as we're observing them. And so we were able to calculate then um, because. Uh, we can we know if the, if we know the mass of those stars, we can determine what the mass of the object is that they're interacting with, and that's how we get that four million solar masses measurement of that supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So, um, supermassive black holes, uh, or any black hole really, um, people often say, well, what happens when a black hole eats something? So here's a video, an artist interpretation. Again, there's a black hole in the bottom left part of the screen. Can't see it uh, until some star, in this example, a star is going to come too close, and then the gravitational pull of the galaxy, of the black hole, is going to strip the star of a lot of its gas and dust uh, surrounding it, and then start feeding itself into the black hole. So um, we still don't see the black hole itself, but the material that is orbiting around it is spinning so quickly that friction builds up, a ton of friction is um, building up as all this gas is swirling around that black hole and falling into it, that it produces uh, a ton of radiation. And you're also blowing out particles that are around that black hole, so you create this, this wind of optical light and particles and x-ray photons, uh, this really high, highly energetic soup that's uh, can have an impact on the galaxy that is surrounding it. So um, then we can determine that we're, which galaxies have these uh, eating black holes. So we call when a black hole is eating something, we say that it is accreting something. Kind of rhymes, kind of sounds the same. So that disk of material surrounding the black hole is called an accretion disk. So as I said earlier, all that friction creates a ton of radiation, a ton of light, so that the black hole uh, shines, paradoxically, because the black hole itself is not shining, but all the material surrounding it uh, shines so brightly that it looks like there's a star at the center of the galaxy. So here are two galaxies uh, taken with uh, image with the Hubble Space Telescope, and the one on the left has an active black hole in the center, and the one on the right does not. And so it looks like there is a star-like point source in this active galaxy because all of that light is shining toward us. And in the normal galaxy, we're not seeing um, this activeness. And so uh, this particular case is if the, the radiation, all that light is beaming toward us, but sometimes it's pointed into the plane of the disk of the host galaxy, and you get these really cool structures. And so what you see here are the, the center points are where the, the black holes are, and the light is going out kind of in the plane of the picture or in the plane of the galaxy here, and it lights up all the material, these spiraling um, spiral arms uh, and dust lanes, and it's lighting up and kind of frying that gas. So the light that we're seeing here only comes from a very fried hot gas. And so we can see that it has this kind of uh, biconical structure where you have the black hole in the center and then it's surrounded by that accretion disk. Um, and then that accretion disk blocks light uh, around it, but uh, in where the disk is, but then perpendicular to that disk, you get all the light coming out and that's what's lighting up this host galaxy. And so we are interested then in how this light interacting with the host galaxy can affect how it evolves over time. And that's kind of what my job is. is that my job is to measure what kind of impact these active supermassive black holes have on their galaxies. So we could see from those pictures just before that the radiation, the light from the, around these supermassive black holes lights up the host galaxy at large distances. But we think closer in on like this, uh, maybe a quarter of the, the, the extent of that host galaxy, gas is being blown out of the host disk. And it, when you blow out all that gas, you're removing the uh, material that you could use to form stars. So if the active black hole removes the gas and dust which forms stars, you're affecting how the galaxy evolves over time. So um, I study the way that the gas moves in these galaxies using the Doppler shift. So um, in simple terms, uh, I always like to talk about like a police car or a race car coming towards you and it has a higher pitch sound. As it goes by you, it gets lower. 
And so that's the Doppler shift in effect where you have the object coming towards you, the sound waves are pushed together and you get a higher frequency sound. And then as it goes by you, the wavelengths of the sound are stretched out. You have a lower frequency sound and that produces a different effect. So you can tell from listening to that car which way it's going towards you or away from you. So the, thing, uh, the same thing happens then if we're trying to look at the light from something out millions, billions of light years away from us. And so we can use the Doppler shift of light to figure out if an object is coming toward us or away, going away from us. So here are three different spectra. So spectra, if you're unfamiliar with it, is if you have white light coming from like a light bulb or the sun and it hits like a prism, the light's gonna hit the prism and spread out into your full rainbow of colors, uh, Roy G. Biv, or backwards here, blue to red, um, where blue is the highest uh, energy photon, the shortest wavelength, the higher frequency sound, and then the red is the lower energy wavelength, the, the lower frequency sound, if you will. And so if we look at features in that spectrum, it's not always a perfect rainbow. There's gonna be some different things we can track. If those, uh, for this example, we have absorption lines. Um, if they're redder than what we expect them to be in the laboratory, we know that that object is traveling away from us. And if it, uh, those absorption lines are at a bluer wavelength than what we expect in a laboratory, then we know that that object is coming toward us. And so we use the Doppler shift of the light that we're observing because for the most part, all astronomers um, can really look at is just the light that's coming from all these objects. Um, and so we can then tell if that gas is moving toward us or away from us, is it rotating? Is it blowing out from the center out into the galaxy? Uh, and we can use these, what we call kinematic measurements to determine what's going on in the galaxy. So here is a picture then of another one of those uh, extended structures. So you have the black hole shining into the host plane of the galaxy again. And you can see this kind of biconical structure going up and down in this picture. And so if we observe it uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is a, a long slit spectrograph, which just means that you're, you're observing the object along this really long band, and you're getting a spectrum at each step down that long band um, to figure out what the gas is doing. And so this is what, uh, this is data from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's gonna look like this. And so you can see as your each uh, row here is a spectrum of the gas that you're looking at along this galaxy. And so if we apply the Doppler shift then to this, this is an emission line feature. If we apply the Doppler shift, we can see the stuff to the right of the, what we know is the, the systemic velocity where it's not move, it's not redshifted or blue shifted. We can see that that's all redshifted. And then below the, the central point, most everything is blue shifted here. And so we can use that to measure how fast this gas is traveling and how far away from the central black hole this gas is traveling at these higher velocities than what we'd expect if the gas was just rotating. So this is called long slit spectroscopy. This is the best thing that the Hubble Space Telescope can do for us right now to do these velocity measurements of the gas that the black hole is pushing away from itself. So besides the, the Hubble Space Telescope, I also use ground-based um, telescopes because they have this really cool instrument that can take a picture of a galaxy and that each individual pixel of that picture also has a spectrum. So this is cool in two ways. Uh, one, you can just take uh, pictures in different filters or different colors of a galaxy all at the same time and see what's going on with different types of light. Or you can do that uh, kinematic analysis, that Doppler shift analysis at each individual point in that galaxy. So it's kind of like you're taking a picture of a marathon and you can see how fast each one of the runners is. And if they're coming towards you or away from you, maybe one runner, it looks like it's gonna pass another runner because he's traveling a lot faster. Um, and so you can use this type of instrument, which is called an integral field unit, um, to get this sort of three dimensional data set, which is, and there's just a ton of data. So a lot of my time 
uh, here working on my computer is analyzing these, these individual data sets. So for one single galaxy, you have thousands of spectra that you have to measure to figure out what the gas and the stars are doing in each one of these um, galaxies. So you have one galaxy that's, let's say, 5,000 spectra per color, and then you have maybe six colors. So that's 30,000 measurements that you have to do um, to get a good idea of what's going on in each one of these galaxies. So here's kind of an example of something that I, I've done recently. And so here is another one of those uh, AGN, those, I'm sorry, those black holes shining into the host galaxy. And I've taken the picture of the central region and, I, and each one of those pixels, I've got information about what the stars are doing and then what the hot gas is doing. And so on the left, you can see that the stars are rotating around in the host disk of the galaxy. And we can see then that the hot gas is not rotating. It's actually getting driven outward because the black hole is shining into the material of the host disk and spewing out a bunch of material and pushing it uh, out away from it. And so this is that, that evacuation of uh, star forming material that we think has a big role in how galaxies evolve over time. So I work with a lot of telescopes, um, and that's because each different telescope has a lot of different abilities. So uh, a lot of the images that you, all the images that you saw of galaxies here are taken from the Hubble Space Telescope because it has the best resolution, the best seeing of any sort of telescope that we can uh, get our hands on right now. So those are typically what we use for our imaging analysis. But then we have to go to those ground-based telescopes, like I had said earlier, to get that um, data set where you take the picture and get the spectrum at each individual pixel of your picture. So that's a, at a telescope in, uh, in Hawaii. You don't actually get to go to Hawaii to use the telescope. They have somebody sitting in the chair doing the observations for you because it's a very large and expensive telescope and they don't want you to screw anything up because they would be very upset. And everybody else that's scheduled to get time on that telescope would also be very upset if you screwed something up. Same thing for the Hubble Space Telescope. Both of these telescopes, you just tell them how you want to observe your uh, galaxy or your star and what kind of instruments you want to use. And they will go get the data for you and then you have to analyze that data once it's ready. And then uh, we also use another, the other observatory at Apache Point uh, in New Mexico. And this one you actually can go to and you need to go to to learn how it works. So you get to go there once or twice and work with the telescope and that telescope operator to set up your observations. And then from then on, you can actually open up your laptop and do observing from your laptop at home. So I would get up at 2 in the morning to do the second half of a night. And I would be sitting there with my coffee with a cat on my lap doing uh, all the observing that I need to do from the comfort of my own home, which is really, really neat. So these are just a couple of the telescopes I use. There, there are, uh, and it's mostly for the, 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 the research that I've talked about. But you also want to look at stuff in the x-rays. So we use x-ray space telescopes. We also want to look at what the radio structure is doing. So we use ground-based radio dish arrays. Uh, and so we need. And for every different wavelength, you're always going to have to go to a different telescope to get that extra facet of information, that extra detail. And then it's your job to put them all together to tell the continuous story about what's going on with your uh, object that you're studying. So in the future, uh, the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope is going to be awesome because you're combining the benefits of the Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, with the really neat instruments that we only have available currently on the ground. That integral field unit, that picture, that camera that has the spectrum at each individual pixel. They're strapping one of those on the James Webb Space, they're strapping two of those on the James Webb Space Telescope and sending it out there. So we're gonna get pristine, amazing observing conditions that we get in space. And then we're gonna have the very awesome detailed data sets from the instruments that are only available currently on the ground. So the James Webb Space Telescope for me is going to be really great because I get those benefits, but we're also going to allow us to look at galaxies that are at higher redshifts. So as I said earlier with the Doppler shift, uh, as galaxies go further and further away from you, you're going to have um, your 
light that you usually see in the optical become red shifted because it's going farther and farther away. Mm. Can't even hear it anymore because it's such a low wavelength, it's not even perceptible to you. Same thing for the optical light, it's now in the infrared. So now the James Webb Space Telescope looks at things in the infrared and we can continue doing studies of galaxies at greater distances from us to see how things change over time. And that's a really awesome aspect of the James Webb Space Telescope. So um, Travis, I'm just getting started thinking about doing astrophysics. What can I do to prepare? That's a great question, person sitting in that classroom looking at me. Um, first of all, you wanna look into research opportunities before going to college. Uh, any sort of um, research programs, maybe there's an observatory nearby or a university that you can talk to, a professor that's doing some sort of projects. These are rare. However, if you can get started in that, that's the best foothold to make connections and understand jargon and uh, begin your astronomical career is to get your feet wet and just jump in to see what kind of uh, research opportunities are available. Um, otherwise, you can really focus yourself and become a sharp, awesome person that is knowledgeable in math and physics and programming. Um, so when you think of an astronomer, maybe you think of me sitting in front of a telescope, squinting out into the sky and learning about the cosmos. I rarely ever do that. It's more me sitting in front of my computer with the data that somebody has given me, and I'm analyzing it with my programming uh, computer skills. So the better you are at writing up code and doing analysis and um, working with a computer, the, be the more prepared you're gonna be for coming into astronomy or not astronomy, biology or chemistry or any like uh, business, any, anything. I mean, any way that you can use a computer uh, to do programming skills is gonna make you a valuable asset wherever you go. So if there's one thing that you should work on Moving forward, it's programming. Computer high school class, way to go. Robotics guys, you guys are awesome. So, um, and then what else do I wanna talk about? Oh, you wanna get involved with citizen science projects? Uh, maybe involve yourself with a math and physics club or work at a museum to do like an open house or something. Uh, this is just showing like to yourself that you're committed, that you're interested in the work that, that would be a part of being an astronomer. And it really looks great on your resume that you, you are interested and you're going out and getting stuff done and participating already. So that would, that's also, it's similar to doing a research opportunity, but uh, it's just more of a, of a outreach type program. And then finally, uh, you also wanna practice your communication skills because nobody is gonna sit in their office all day and not talk to anybody about their work. You need to get your results out to people and let them know about all the cool things you just discovered. And the only way you're gonna really do that well is if you are good with your communication skills. Are you good at verbal giving talks? If you wanna go to a conference and talk about your results in front of people, make sure that it's exciting. Uh, you also wanna have good paper writing skills so that you get your ideas across very easily to folks. And a lot of times, um, you're not doing, when you're not doing observing, you're doing proposing to do the observing. So you need to ask people to let them use your telescopes. And so you need to write a very nice proposal that will get accepted. The best way to write a proposal is to have good communication skills, not to mention the amazing science that you wanna do, but communication skills are key. So uh, that's all for me. Um, what time is it? It is uh, 11.30, so I think I went a little long. But please, um, I'd like to know what you guys are thinking um, and what kind of questions you might have. Great. Well, thank you so, so much for that, Travis. Uh, I want to note before we dive into questions with the classes that we've got a few groups watching on YouTube live as well. If you want to type your question into the chat bar, I can pass it directly on. So please do do that. Uh, first, we'll go to the group that you uh, praised, the robotics group. Uh, and Mashby, if you guys have any questions, come on up. Go ahead. Sam does. They can hear you. You've got to go stand up and ask the question. Quickly, he's coming. <laughs> With enthusiasm. You, no, it's just his high school kids. You guys know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question about the active galaxies that you're talking about. I don't know if you explained it or not, but what's the difference between a normal galaxy and an active galaxy? Right. So the active galaxy just means that the supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy is actively eating stuff. So that means that stuff is falling into that supermassive black hole. 
Uh, and that forms that accretion disk. I showed that movie of the, of the stuff swirling around that black hole. And so when it swirls around, you're creating a whole ton of friction. And that, that friction builds up and releases a lot of light, a lot of radiation. And so that whole process, the central engine of black hole, accretion disk, ton of radiation impacting the galaxy around it, that makes the galaxy active. But it's really the active galactic nucleus that we're interested in. That's what it is, an AGN, uh, if you will. Cool. All right. Let's go to Miss Alini's class. You guys have a question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, how is a black hole made or born? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, we kind of, we have a good idea of how stellar mass black holes are formed. And so uh, we have very massive stars, stars that are uh, 10 to 20 times more massive than our sun. And when a star is churning out light, it's fusing hydrogen together because of all the pressure, everything is pushed together so tight that you're fusing hydrogen atoms together and that creates helium and it creates photons and those photons push out. And so that's a, a, a pressure pushing outward against gravity pulling in. But eventually you run out of hydrogen and then the hydrogen fuses into helium and you run out of helium to fuse into other things and eventually the push outward stops. And so if you have enough mass, a really massive star, the gravitational acceleration of everything collapsing in collapses into such a teeny tiny massive dense thing that you create a black hole. So the white dwarf from our sun, the neutron star from the more massive stars, and then the black hole from the most massive stars are all kind of the same thing. They're just not it's just different densities. A white dwarf is less dense than a neutron star, and a neutron star is less dense than a black hole. And it's just that the black hole is so dense that nothing can escape uh, outside of a certain dis or inside of a certain distance from it. Um, that escape velocity that we were talking about before. So it's easy to launch a rocket off of Earth because our escape velocity is small. It is impossible to launch a rocket off of a black hole because its escape velocity is faster than the speed of light, and we don't know how to get to ever do that. Oh, so Sorry, so supermassive black holes, we don't know exactly how they're formed yet. We think that they kind of uh, formed with the formation of the galaxy that they live in, but that's still something that we're trying to figure out uh, is exactly how did they get so big? What are they doing there? And where'd they come from? So that's something we want to figure out. Excellent. Uh, before we go to the next class, just a quick follow-up. So when they collapse in, do they blow up first? Do they instantly become a black that's hole? Right. Uh, so yes, you always you also hear about the term supernova, and so yeah, when you have that star collapse, uh, it all that collapsing it allows it to get really energetic and hot one last time, and then it blows off a bunch of the material that is on that star, and that's where you get these really beautiful supernova remnants from. Is these explosions, this one final last gasp of these stars forming these supernovae, and then what remains? At the very center, then, is typically this super or this black hole, this stellar mass black hole, or a neutron star, depending on how massive the progenitor or the initial star was. Excellent. All right, let's go to Mr. Wright's class. You guys figured out the camera. Way to go. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. What happens if um, a, could a black hole collapse in on itself? Uh, I don't think it can collapse anymore. So, uh, Sometimes people think that a supermassive black hole is a hole in the universe, that it's a hole punched, and that it's like got to be going somewhere, um, like a wormhole or something like that. But that's not the case. I mean, a, a supermassive black or any black hole is still an object, just like a neutron star or a white dwarf or a star or a planet. It's just the densest, most extreme object in the universe. So it's still like this infinitesimally dense thing but it's still an object. So I don't think it can collapse on itself any more than it's already collapsed. It's like, we're done, this is as far as we can go, we're it. But it's a good question, because black hole's a term that really like sort of breeds confusion, because it seems like a hole punch in the universe. That's right. Yeah, I'm sure you deal with that a lot. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go to Montague, to the homeschool group. If you guys have a question, come on up. 
Hi, Arrow. You can just talk to the computer. Maybe get a little closer. Um. Go ahead, Diana. Can you explain what a solar minimum is? Uh, solar, solar minimum. Solar minimum. Well, a solar minimum, I would guess, is when you're talking about the solar um, activity on the sun. So the sun is the star and it's churning around. It's got a lot of plasma. Um, on, in, uh, it's just a ball of plasma, essentially, of this hot gas. And so it goes through these 11-year cycles of activity. So you hear the term uh, sunspot sometimes. And so that's where you have um, these magnetic fields that erupt out of the star of our sun and you see these really cool filaments of plasma that are maybe coming out of the star. So actually, yeah, maybe I can go back and just show just that picture of our sun because I made that. Um, I'm going to try to screen share, Jesse. Yep. Take your time. Sharing. Okay. Um, right. So you have um, this picture then. You see these flares uh, coming off the side of the star. And those are these magnetic fields that have broken on the, uh, on the sun for some reason. I'm not really sure why. I'm not a, a, a sun guy. Um, but I know that that's where these sunspots then are created. And that's it, what looks like the brighter in this picture are actually these cooler uh, spots that we can see when we take um, like uh, large wavelength, like multi, like it's a white picture image of the sun. So when you're at a solar minimum, that means that you're not getting a ton of the, the solar activity to be going on. You don't have flares or sunspots or anything like that. And it looks like a very uh, white boring cue ball when you take the uh, optical the picture of the sun. So I don't know why it has these 11 year cycles. I think neither do many astronomers and that's why we're trying to figure it out. Um, and that's, that's important for us to understand our sun. It's important for us to understand other stars when we're trying to look at them. But that's what a solar minimum is. Excellent, thank you, Travis. Uh, all right, we have Mr. Atkinson's grade sevens and Barry join us about halfway through. Uh, so guys, you just need to demute your own mic. So if you come to the front in your computer, little microphone symbol at the top of your screen, if you click that, you're good to go. And then uh, I'll let you know when you're ready. You're good. Okay. Um, how do you? No, you're good. Okay. Um, how does an active supermassive black hole become no longer active? Great. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so when I showed a video and if you guys came in late, I'll just play it again, um, of what we think, how we think a, a, a black hole becomes active. Am I, am I screen sharing? Uh, not yet. Please. Okay. Do, do, do. So you have a black hole in the bottom left, you have a star coming in and this is just one example of a star becoming, coming too close and the material is stripped away from the star and you're forming this active black hole, this accretion disk around the black hole, which produces all the light that we're interested in. So the best way to turn off an active black hole is to stop feeding it. And so we think that these supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies are typically eating like a galaxy or a remnant of a galaxy that merged with it, or maybe some sort of, um, accident, a collision between two stars that maybe helps it fall in. Um, and so you get these feeding events, but once they're done eating, then they're done being active. And then they're back to being called quiescent galaxies, which means they're just chilling out. So this might be a uh, nice time to discuss uh, black holes and whether they suck or not. So just to clarify, black holes do not suck. Um, they are just regular objects like anything else. So if we replace the sun in our solar system with a black hole uh, of the same mass, nothing would happen. It would just be a lot colder. We'd probably die because it'd be cold. But nothing, we wouldn't fall into that, that black hole at all. And so the way things fall into a black hole is they lose that orbital momentum that they have uh, going around um, that, that black hole. So if you put a giant Earth-sized brick wall in front of Earth, and it ran into that brick wall and it lost its orbital momentum, it would then fall into that supermassive black hole or the sun if the sun was still there and be eaten by the sun slash black hole. But black holes don't like, they're not a vacuum if they don't see something and they just pull it right in. It has to have lost its orbital momentum some one way or another. So uh, galaxy mergers or um, these stars colliding or something like that, that's what produces the, the food for these black holes then. 
I love that. Thank you for that moment where it's like nothing will happen except we freeze and die. That's right. um, no like, problem. Travis, do you have time for another round of questions from every class? I'm fine. I got, I'm, I got plenty of time. Perfect. Well, let's go back to the robotics group then for a second question. Dylan has a question for you. Hi, Dylan. What's on the other side of black holes? So the black hole doesn't have a side. So there's not, um, like, so what we were saying earlier is that like a black hole isn't like a hole punch in the universe that if you went through, if it becomes this other un other dimension or something like that, a super or any sort of black hole is a, the same object as like a neutron star or a white dwarf or a star or a planet or an asteroid. It just is so compact and so smooshed together that it's impossible for light to escape off the surface of it because it's very, very, very dense. So it's still inside of that black hole is some very infinitesimally small thing. So it's not uh, a plane or like a, like a gate or a hole or anything, like a wormhole. The black holeness of it is kind of a misnomer because it's still an object. You just can't see the light out of it. So it looks like a black hole. But where it, you would just look on the other side is the inside of it. And but you wouldn't know. We, we wouldn't know. We just get smooshed on top of it and become a really fine, very thin layer on top of that black hole. You mentioned uh, wormhole there, which is where that question came from. Could you explain just briefly what that would be, like why people think that you can maybe go yeah, through a black I don't know, hole? Because Star Trek is uh, was awesome for a while, and um, Star Wars is awesome. Did they go through a wormhole in Star Wars? I can't remember. But, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting aspect to be like, well, where does it go? Maybe a black hole has a white hole somewhere else in the universe that it corresponds with, and everything that goes into a black hole comes out the white hole. And that's not how it works. It's not some sort of interdimensional uh, or intergalactic portal. It's just an object. So I, I'm not familiar with any actual astronomical object that would resemble a wormhole, unfortunately. Crushing our dreams, but that's okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> truth is important. So <laughs> on that right. note, <laughs> we'll go to Miss uh, Leaning Group again. For the second question. <laughs> Any seconds in C fourth, guys? Questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, my question is, what's on that whiteboard behind you? Oh. Don't look at my secret things. No. So this is a, a whiteboard I installed. What's on there is mostly a to-do list. So the things on the left are different papers that are in the process of either being submitted or that we're writing them or that I should start on something for that paper. Um, so that's just a different to-do list. Um, the stuff on the right is uh, dimensions of those, those 3D data cubes that I was talking about um, for a specific set so I don't forget them. And then that main thing is just a to-do list um, for, for research that I'm doing. So anytime you have an idea, a big idea, or a reminder to not let yourself forget about. You always just have your whiteboard. Or if you have collaborators um, come over and you want to talk about ideas, this is the perfect place to do it. Then you draw out and be like, this is what I'm imagining in my brain. Uh, and then maybe you can explain it to one another and help communicate better. Cool. Uh, all right, let's go to Mr. Wright's class. OK, uh, another question we had. Have you heard of any instances where a super black hole has taken in a uh, smaller black hole, or is that even? Are they even capable of doing that? Sure. So this is really an exciting forefront of astronomy, and uh, so that is the merger of high density objects like black holes or neutron stars, and they produce um, what is what are called gravitational waves. And so this is a very new thing in astronomy where we have just detected the first gravitational waves. Uh, just like a year or two ago. And so when these two really dense objects, these black holes merge, uh, they ripple the actual fabric of the universe. And so things get stretched out and smooshed together very finely, but it happens. It was theoretically uh, hypothesized uh, decades ago, I think maybe by Einstein. And then they actually detected those, that merger, um, those mergers for, or I'm sorry, 
um, neutron stars uh, not not too long ago. And so that's where we learned that when you have these high, these very dense objects collide, um, that's the laboratory or the uh, factory that produces these really heavy elements that we have on Earth, like gold or platinum. Like the only way you can really create those things is when you have neutron stars merging and exploding, creating what's called a kilonova. And so uh, that's something we didn't know more than a year ago or something like that. And so that's what happens then when you have these, these mergers go on, you, they, they eat each other. Well, if it was black holes, I'm not really sure yet because we haven't seen two black holes merge. We haven't seen it. We've felt the gravitational waves, but we haven't seen what happens. So we know that it creates gravitational waves. I don't know what kind of like optical um, counterpart happens if there's like any sort of emission. I'm not sure, but uh, we would feel it, uh, or we'd be able to detect that happening, but we wouldn't feel it. Very cool, and and it's always nice when scientists get a chance to say that like we are literally on the forefront of science. Things that we're discovering last year for kids these days, because that's a right. uh, you know open for more exploration later. Uh, all right, let's go back to Montague for the group there. You guys have another question? Uh, oh, did they just disappear? Yeah, no, they're there. Good. Come on up, guys. You're good. What shape is a black hole, and what would happen if you fall into it? Um, what shape is a black hole? I would say the black hole is spherical. Just uh, like everything, like neutron stars and white dwarfs and, star and stars like that, because that is the most stable shape. Because if you have everything pulling in, to the very central point, uh, if you have a sphere, then any direction you're looking at, everything is getting pulled in the equal amount. They're each feeling the equal amount of gravitational pull. So if you had like a cube, then the stuff that uh, the points of the cube would feel a greater pull than the flat sides of the cube. And so those would get smooshed down into that ball again. So everything, mostly everything that is massive enough is going to have a spherical shape. Uh, what happens when you fall into a black hole? Well, you're going to continue falling past what is that, that radius of the black hole. So when we talk about the radius, of how big is a black hole? That's the event horizon. And that's basically just the distance at which light can't escape again. But that doesn't mean that uh, that's the physical surface of the black hole. I think the physical surface is going to be infinitesimally um, small. But So you're just going to get stretched out really thin because each individual inch or centimeter that you travel closer to that supermassive black hole or that stellar mass black hole, the uh, amount of acceleration that you're going to feel falling is going to be hugely different than that inch or centimeter that was above you. So you're going to get stretched real thin, spaghettified into a really long thread until you fall onto the surface of that black hole and get smeared across it. So it's not going to be a pleasant Experience. But it'll be a once in a lifetime experience that you'll never forget. <laughs> and on that note, I'm so glad spaghettification got brought up. Uh, let's do one last question for Mr. Atkinson's group, and we'll wrap up after that. And you're good. I actually I can demute you now because one class had to leave, so you're good. Okay. How do you measure the gravity of things in space that are so far away? Uh, right. So you um, you can measure the gravitational pull of something by knowing what its mass is. And so the way that you detect what a mass, the mass of something is, is how it interacts with other things. So um, we saw in this video, I'm going to share the screen one last time. Um, so here's a video of, so the star here represents the position of the supermassive black hole in our galaxy. And we see lots of, and those rainbow dots are real stars that are orbiting around the supermassive black hole. So thanks to lots of stellar astronomers who know a lot about stars, we can measure the light coming from them and figure out how massive those stars are. And if we know how massive the stars are and we can see how they move, we know how massive that black hole has to be to make the stars do what we're observing. So it's always an interaction, a two body, process where we can see things interact um, is typically how we learn about how massive something is. So for other black holes um, in other galaxies, we typically look at, again, this, this stellar velocity. Um, that's one way. There's other ways that I don't want to get into right now. But 
I mean, we have multiple techniques to uh, measure the, the effect of the mass on the host system that it lives in. Excellent. Uh, Travis, what we do at the end of every <laughs> is, so I'm going to demute every class's microphone, so boys and girls, uh, all four classes that are with us still. Oh, we're uh, going to say goodbye. We're going to be like, y'all don't say anything. Yeah, goodbye and thank you so much to Travis for joining us today. Bye, guys. And you, and you. Awesome. Uh, for all our classes, we're celebrating space all month long, so do check out some of our other hangouts. Uh, the Mars Insight Lander last, landed yesterday, so please check that out as well. Uh, Travis, thanks so much for joining us today and, and sharing all your awesome.